We take you now to England. If it only were as simple as that. If you could take a man, like a radio wave, and whisk him over the Atlantic, and then drop him through a loudspeaker, and let him wander for a month over the face of this island, would he be any different at the end of his wandering? How would he feel about the war and about England? Would the United States look very much different to him from the outside? From the Anglo-American angle? The Columbia Broadcasting System presents An American in England. The last of a limited series of six programs written and directed by Norman Corwin, produced by Edward R. Murrow, and broadcast from somewhere in the British Isles. Joseph Julian narrates, and the original musical score is by Benjamin Britton. Tonight, an Anglo-American angle. Did you ring, sir? Uh, yes, Mac. I'm going to clear out at the end of the week, so I'd like my suit back from the cleaners. Yes, sir. Uh, going up north, sir? No, back to the States. <laughs> going home, eh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'd like to go to America someday, sir. Well, maybe you will after the war. They'll probably be running clippers every hour, on the hour. <laughs> uh, might I ask you, sir, before you go, uh, if you aren't doing anything with those magazines on the desk? Uh, you want them? Uh, if you please, sir, yes. My wife is crazy about American magazines. I'll tell you what. There are a couple of pieces I promised to read, and I'll do that tonight. But you can take the whole pile in the morning. Thank you very much. Okay. Good day, sir. That night, you go through the magazines. As you fan their slick pages, you find yourself seeing things through the admiring eyes of Mac and his wife. You can barely hear them gasping at the advertisements. Kinless Frankfurters. Sends a free booklet of tempting recipes. To a housewife whose sausages have been 60% bread for some time, the skinlessness of Frankfurters must be an interesting improvement. Clean and polish your car with one application of this sensational new polish. Your car will sparkle with that original showroom shine. Mac's car has been in storage for three years now and has that original junk pile dullness. For fragrant, shining, clean hair, alive with highlights, Get this brand new shampoo today. Mrs. Mack's hair will have to do without fragrance for the duration. And also be unshining. Because there's practically no shampoo to be had. You look at the magnificent color advertisements of hosiery and grapefruit and new furniture. And it's like the Arabian Nights. You're not really reading Click and Life. But a series of illustrative fairy tales having to do with a legendary country where oranges grow on trees and where the enchanted pig turns into a beautiful side of Virginia ham. Yes, a kind of never-never land flowing with milk and honey and canned tomato juice. Very far off. The cities without a bomb ruin and the princesses in the nylon stockings. Yes, after being away from home only two months, it seems distant and old world. The land where at a fountain of youth they serve ice cream sodas and hamburgers perpetually. And no coupons asked either. There's another ad. Do you have trouble sleeping? Try the improved Beauty Rest mattress. The royal road to sleep for health and comfort. Ah, that gets you. Gets you sleepy just looking at the ad. It shows a healthy, comfortable American in four colors snoozing away on the royal road to sleep. And a good suggestion, too. You're tired. Although it may be only 10 p.m. in New York, it's 3 a.m. in England, and that means you. So you put your shoes outside the door and are just about to get into bed when... an alert sound. You put out your light and go to the window... Pull back the curtain. Nothing is happening that you can see. Just some more Nazi raiders flying overhead for nuisance value on their way to bomb two old women and a storekeeper somewhere in the Midlands. You close the curtains 
stretch and yard. When in England, do as the English do. You go to bed. theater. On the bill are a series of shorts, mostly American, mostly very good. One is a collection of tremendous production numbers taken from lavish musical films of the past, hundreds of girls and boys dancing on staircases. Those were the days, all right. Two cars in every garage and a beautiful chicken in every plot. Ten years ago, it required a cast of thousands to impress Britons with the might and majesty of America. Today it takes a mess of skinless frankfurters and a bottle of shampoo. On comes the newsreel, in the usual quiet fashion, with health and music over the title. Elfin like an elephant. You're shown a picture of American rangers and parachutists and flyers in training, and it gladdens your eyes to see them. The voice on the soundtrack says categorically they're the best fighters in the world. And you wonder, looking out of the corner of your eye, how that must sound to natives in the audience who remember the Spitfire pilots in the Battle of Britain. You hope and trust the voice is right. But then, of course, Patty Finnegan was no slouch, and Wavell's men in Libya and Timoshenko's men at Sevastopol did rather well for second raiders. Next comes an entertaining American comedy. And the audience enjoys all except one scene. A scene in which an inexperienced housewife drops eggs all over the floor and ruins a big cake. That ain't funny in this country. On the way out, you run into the manager of the theater and chat with him for a while. He says he likes Hollywood product, has a great respect for it. The impression most of us get out of your pictures is that the United States is a country of great power and energy, of enterprise. That's why you'll find so many people here want to visit the States. That's the national anthem coming from the screen inside the house. God save the king. The tune we lifted for one of our own hymns. Playing of the anthem means it's 10 p.m. and the show's over. All movie houses close at 10 and there's no midnight show on Saturday. You have an appointment at the London office of a great American radio network. You take a taxi through a badly bombed area, pull up outside a plain apartment building. Across the street is a bombed synagogue. Only its walls remain. Next to the shattered entrance stands an inscription. Blessed is he whose conscience hath not condemned him, and who has not fallen from his hope in the Lord. You get on a rickety lift, go up four flights, ring a bell, and are ushered into a modest apartment. The walls are cracked from bomb blast. You meet your friend, and he takes you along with him to the main building of the BBC. It's battle-scarred and wears war paint. Policemen stand guard inside and out. You descend to the cellar, the sub-cellar, the sub-sub-cellar, and deeper still. There are cots in some of the studios. Many of the staff sleep here. No murals around this place. No conducted studio tours. Nothing for the eye. It's grim, almost military. It has special chambers in case of gas attack. Your host prepares to broadcast. The preceding program comes through from America. There's music, and then the voice of David Ross. It sounds far away, as London sounds to listeners at home. It has an unreal quality. Again, the Arabia of a thousand and one night. And then, out of a London cellar, your friend speaks to the rooftops of America. This is London. Soon it will be winter again, the fourth winter of war. 
It will be a test of moral and physical endurance such as only the veteran can meet. This is now a veteran people. The future holds anxiety, but no terror. From you, they ask not sympathy, but understanding. Not help, but comradeship. Much of the old order has gone, but the right of free men to die on their feet remains. The choice was made by free men. For them, there can be no going back. For three minutes, he speaks across an ocean that is half in daylight, half in night. And then he calls in Cairo. We take you now to Cairo. Cairo comes in. And the capsule world is there for Kansas and Missouri and for the lounge of the Beverly Hills Hotel. In the bowels of the British earth, you listen to programs coming from the States. There's music. There's a songster singing, Johnny Doughboy Found a Rose in Ireland. And you wonder whether every last broadcast from the state would reward listeners in occupied countries who tune in at the risk of their lives. If radio was important enough for the Hun to spend billions of dollars on it, and effective enough to help beat France before the Panzers got there, is it too fantastic to hope that someday the United Nations might appoint a radio high command and use the weapon to its fullest? So wondering, you swing the dial to another shortwave point and hear moonlight and roses. Hotel in the West End of London, you find on the dinner menu an item reading Le Tasse de Consommé au Vatoski, Stalin. They're honoring Stalin on the menu at the Savoy. And that sounds like another blow to Hitler. Because next to separating the United States and Great Britain, his greatest hope has been to separate Russia and Great Britain. It dampens you a little not to find a consomme in honor of an American. But then, of course, Russia is more popular in Great Britain than we are. The Reds happen to be killing more Germans than anyone else. And you think, as you sip your soup, of a conversation you had the other day with a British newspaper man about Britain, the USSR, and the USA. Tell me, are there any quarters in America still hostile to Russia? Yes, I dare say there are. Scattered, of course, but there. Tory press, mostly. You know, that's something I can't understand. We consider it extremely bad tactics from a military as well as a moral point of view to criticize an ally or to cast suspicion on him, especially if he's doing most of the fighting. I see your point. The meat dish arrives. It's lamb on a skewer. Sometime you hope to see a dish on this menu called La Fricassée de Pouladine au Pomme à la Franklin de Roosevelt. leaning against the counter in the pub looks depressed. And you wonder whether it's the warm beer or the weather or the news from the front. So you ask him, what makes you so glum? Oh, I don't know. I guess I miss the good old days. Before the war, you mean? No, 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 no. I mean the Blitz days, when we were getting bombed every night. Are you kidding? Not at all. There was spirit then. We were in the thick of the fight. Everything we did took on a kind of importance, because it might well have been the last time we did it. But this, uh, this suspended animation, this frustration, this business of war settling down to be a normal condition... I don't get it. I should think you'd be grateful for quiet nights. Well, yes, I suppose you would think so. You're an American, and your country so far is only ankle deep in the war. The things that happen to people when they're up to their eyebrows in it, expecting bombs in their living room, are not so terrifying as you might imagine. In fact, being up to one's eyebrows in war can be inspiring. Your friend gets up to order some beers, and you fall to wondering whether your fellow Americans will need the stimulus of danger and fire from the sky to drive them to the greatest possible exertion. You wonder whether your people back home would stand for any sniping and beefing 
If they were raided as a matter of routine twice daily, or if the enemy were besieging Pittsburgh, would they still tolerate radio commentators who complain about the dim out? Would they still put up with newspapers which attacked their allies? Newspapers which not long before Pearl Harbor were urging that we give China to the Japs and even now are suggesting that we leave Russia to the Germans and that we'd be better... Well, we'd better beware of Britain's intentions after the war. You wonder. The man waiting in the dentist's anteroom, and by the way, dentists are called Mr. here and not Dr., looks unusually happy for anybody waiting to see a dentist. You ask him why. Well, I've just got a packet of food from a friend in the States. A whole pound of butter, among other things. I thought they stopped the shipment of food to individuals. No. There were some announcements to that effect, but the fact is you can still get packets. Well, what about the millions of British people who have no friends in the States to send them food? Listen, that butter tastes awfully good. Hmm. No doubt it does. The two armchair experts who never flew a plane sit arguing in the billiard room of a club about who has better planes, the Americans or the British. All Americans think their planes are superior. My nationality has nothing to do with it. I'm talking about the performance of planes. Well, so am I. It just so happens that half your fighters are useless about 15,000 feet, whereas the Spitfire... This goes on for a while with much throwing around of B-17s, Mustangs, Liberators, firepower, maneuverability, etc. And then a guy who's been sitting silently on the other side of the billiard table enters the discussion. If you will pardon me, gentlemen, I think you're both talking utter nonsense. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, the important thing is not who's got the best planes, but whether national or professional pride is going to stand in the way of getting together and learning from each other. Well, I should think that it's... Also, can... whether experience in battle will be translated quickly into production. One of the boys at the billiard table has just made a nice shot. Do you mean to tell me... Do you mean to tell me that there... Is your friend a welfare officer at a tank factory? That there are still jurisdictional labor squabbles in America? Well, not so many. Is it true that some industrialists are fighting the government and labor as though they were the enemy instead of the axis? Well, of course, I have been somewhat out of touch with home since I got here, but I don't think... You come with me, my friend. I want to show you a little demonstration of just how serious we are about production in this country. She takes you to a little courthouse, a plain two-story building, badly in need of paint. In a room the size of a typical magistrate's court in New York, a prosecutor for the Ministry of Labor is telling the magistrate that the two girls before the court... Moreover, they were absent from work on February 9, 10, and 11. And as a result, they held up production to the extent of 29,000 of the components on which they were engaged. Yes. Now, the evidence at hand substantiates that you, Miss Leavell, and you, Miss Hanson, were unnecessarily absent on three days and were late on others. I must say it's disgraceful you're slacking about like this. You know how necessary this work is to your country and to the war. I order you each to pay three pounds damages for neglect of work and eight shillings and sixpence costs. The next case has to do with a man who left one job for another without the permission of the government. He gets a jail sentence. Tell me, in your country, can a worker quit an essential war job in one city to make more money doing non-essential work in some other city? Oh, yes, certainly. That seems strange to me. Why? Well, you see, labor here is kept as close to the machine as a soldier to his gun. The unions made great sacrifices when they allowed their workers to be tied down. But it's a sacrifice they made willingly because they know that under the axis, labor can look forward only to permanent system, a kind of slavery already established in conquered Europe. Has industry had to make sacrifices? Have you seen the excess profits tax? No. Take a look at it. Almost confiscatory. British industry and labor long ago realized that neither stood a chance of surviving unless both made mutual sacrifices. And have both played ball? Played what? Play cricket. Oh, <laughs> yes, both have played ball. <laughs> this is the last listening you'll do on a British radio before setting out for home. It's a pleasant sound in your ears, this old folk tune. This is the England of September sunlight, green fields, and the 
sonnets of Keats that you learned in high school. And down to Kew in lilac time, and the nightingale singing his head off in the Surrey woods. This is the old romantic England. And if you don't mind, you'll turn off the radio. There's no song yet written which conveys the England of a moonless blackout or the England of raiders machine-gunning village folk in front of the marketplace. The England of the munitions worker who gets up before it's light and works all day and comes home after dark to a ration meal and then takes his turn at fire guard duty. The England of 1942 is no tea shoppy. It's a grim, crowded, shabby, busy country with guns in the gardens and bombers in the parks and drilling down at Kew in lilac time. The romance here is the romance of the commandos blowing up guns at the Epp and then strolling back to the beach eating apples. The romance of Lancaster taking off at dusk to raid Nuremberg. The romance of powerful trade unions waiving their hard-won rights for the duration. And the government guaranteeing that they'll get them back. The romance of an excess profits tax with real teeth in it. The romance of price control and rationing and conscripted women and workers who aren't allowed to quit a job or to be absent from it or late for oh, it. Oh, there you are, sir. I was looking for you. Your bags are all packed. Uh, yes, that's fine, Mac. Well, uh... How does it feel to be going back? Well, you know the old saying about home, don't you? No place like it. <laughs> That's right, sir. Well, what train do you take? Uh, Paddington, six. Oh, we've just about got time. Uh, where's the porter? Just then the porter shows up. And you're on your way. hemisphere you call home. The fairyland where the milkman delivers eggs and butter in the morning and nobody has to stand in line for a head of cabbage. The place where blackouts are practiced. And a man can pay his income tax and still have enough left over to buy a cigar. Nobody here begrudges the prosperity of the United States. They'd be crazy to. They're glad of it. And grateful for the help. Past, present, and future. But the English... Excuse me. Are there any first-class carriages on this train? There are, but they're all full. It does seem a shame to have to sit in a third when you have a first-class ticket. I'm in the same boat. Anyway, the scenery is first-class. You sit, chin in hand, watching the first-class scenery go by. And you think of the faces that you've met on this island in two months of wandering. You'll settle for those faces any time. They're no different from American faces. Anybody who can tell them apart is psychic and ought to be reading tea leaves. The man sitting next to you opens a package of cigarettes. Have a cigarette? Oh, uh, thank you very much. What brand is this? Uh, Fifth Avenue. Well, that's funny. The other day I bought some cigarettes called Bronx. Must be a series named after sections of New York City. Oh, is Astoria part of New York? Sure, right across from Manhattan. Well... There's an Astoria brand made by the same outfit. Huh. It's a small world, all right, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> nice guy, that. Typical of the people you meet here. You take a deep drag of Fifth Avenue. And with it, you inhale a solemn thought. There are a lot of typical nice guys on this planet. How does it happen they don't get together? Is it beyond reason that common people can strike up a lasting friendship? Something more permanent than a military alliance? Are the people going to let diplomats decide whether they shall be the same fast friends in peace as they are in war? That would be a pity. Because it isn't the diplomats who are going to pull this war out of the fire. They may help with the arrangements. But you know who's going to win it? The little guy with a third-class ticket sitting opposite guy with a dirt under his fingernails and the fatigue of a 12-hour day in his face. He's won things before in this war. It was he and his wife and his kid brother in the RAF who saved Britain. Not a room full of cabinet ministers. Reading! Reading! Train stop here, five minutes! Reading, England. Reading, Massachusetts. 
Reading, Pennsylvania. All three are in this war. It may be a long way from this Reading to the one in Pennsylvania. But if you took a man from the main street of each town and put them together in a neutral pub, within five minutes they'd be toasting each other's health and pledging the common victory. The little guy of America and the little guy of Britain talk the same language in more ways than one. They know what side their future's buttered on. Although one of them has been taking it a lot harder and longer than the other. When the word comes to dish it out, they'll do the dishing. These Britons are proud people. And they ask no quarter. And they ask no pity. They've been through fire. And they've been tempered by it. But so are we Americans, proud people. Asking nothing but the time and place to meet the enemy. We're a good deal farther from the flame, and we therefore temper slower. But fire is fire, and it's spreading on the earth. And whether it's to be the funeral pyre of all freedom, or the forge in which is shaped the hopeful new world of the common man, is what good common men are dying for tonight. The train speeds on. England slips past you in the dusk. You leave a strong and valiant people to return to one. to the Columbia Broadcasting System's presentation of An Anglo-American Angle, the last of a limited series of six programs under the title of An American in England, written and directed by Norman Cohen, and brought to you by CBS direct from England through the facilities of the British Broadcasting Corporation. Joseph Julian narrated, and the original musical score was composed by Benjamin Britten and performed by the Orchestra of the Royal Air Force under the baton of Wing Commander R.P. O'Donnell. The program was produced by Edward R. Murrow.